a major economy? It's breaking. I'm your host, Steve Van Meter, and thanks for joining me today. And our show today, stability risks are surging, and that's threatening to send shockwaves throughout the global economy. And policymakers are now starting to figure out that they perhaps have done an incredible amount of damage to the global economy. And if this one major economy goes down, it's going to topple the rest of the world. Because one of the challenges we're facing right now, it's not just one country that's on the brink of collapse. We're seeing economies throughout every major industrialized economy around the world are getting closer and closer to their breaking point. And at some point, it's gonna come crumbling down like a house of cards. Now to start out, we're gonna go around the world and come back to the US at the end here. And we're gonna show you which economy is in the worst shape of all. Let's start out by heading over to China because we've been talking about stimulus here and due to all the property developers, you know, we've been talking about a global dollar shortage and this occurs when central bankers invert yield curves and money curves and then the creation center. If we look at the money centers of an economy, well, they're commercial banks. When they lend, they create money. And that's one of the challenges here is when the US commercial banking system is creating money, that money gets sent all around the world through global trade. Well, when they're being constricted about their ability to create loans because the money curves are inverted, well, that means dollars aren't flowing around the world and that causes problems that other central bankers have no ability to solve. So we look at what's going on in China. We see China puts Country Garden on draft list of builders to support. No surprise, because this company's in dire shape, along with the rest of them. But one of the issues that we're seeing in China is they came out, as we talked about yesterday, they were putting together this list of 50 developers, and they're going to take that list to the banks and say, look, banks, you need to lend to these companies no matter what. They want to buy a pencil, you give them a loan. In fact, and don't wait till next quarter, because we're going to cap how much you're going to be able to borrow next quarter quarter because we want to get some of that lending on the books now because these companies are in dire shape and this is what you look at from a policy perspective as a shotgun approach because you don't want to just isolate the companies that are having problems because that will cause outright panic so what do you do just like the regulators and policymakers did during the global financial crisis here with the u.s banks they make all of them part of the problem that way nobody knows for sure who exactly is the worst the inclusion of distressed builders such as Country Garden, which has payments on a dollar bond for the first time last month, underscores regulators shifting stance towards some of the nation's biggest private developers as the property crisis deepens. And that's a key point because the dollar shortage around the world isn't getting any better. So there's nothing these property developers can do to stop the bleeding. It only gets worse until something actually breaks. And as you're going to see, that's coming soon because Chinese President Xi Jinping has stepped up support for the broader economy, issuing more sovereign debt for infrastructure spending, raising the budget deficit ratio, and even making an unprecedented visit to the central bank. So when in doubt, well, just issue more debt because that's always the issue. The problem in your debt-based economy is about creating the right amount of debt, debt that actually creates economic growth. And when you're borrowing money to deal with companies that are hemorrhaging and failing, now, that's not one good way to do it. China's property crisis has engulfed almost all of the largest developers, which have been struggling to repay debts and complete projects since the credit crunch emerged three years ago. This leading to the question now is, how many other developers are having problems? Well, that's why they put out this list of 50, so make sure nobody knows for sure who's having a problem or not. Banky, one of the country's few remaining investment-grade builders, saw its dollar bonds plunge in recent weeks on the heels of Country Garden's default. Banky later received an unusually strong show of support from the local government. And that's exactly the point, that nobody knows what companies are going to face problems, so everyone's being treated the same. And this is why Beijing stepped in and saying, look, we're going to cover this up. We're going to cover it up with more debt because that's exactly what these companies need is just more debt right now. Let's get this done. And the real problem is we need the global economy to turn around and expand. The hope still remains that we're gonna achieve a soft landing. But as you're gonna see in a little bit, this major economy, even the policymakers there, well, they're starting to have second thoughts. 
As we head over to Hong Kong, bankers have lots of free time and anxiety is deal slump. And you might be wondering, what does this really matter? Well, it's always in the details because if you start to see the banking system slow down, which we've talked about on the show, is a major problem. It's happening here in the US. It leads to one important problem occurring. And once that starts to take hold, well, then it's only an, a matter of time before an economy heads into recession and potentially a complete financial crisis. In this current environment of slow deal flow and layoffs in the financial industry, people are keen to take long holidays. But I expect they're also worried about being from their office too long. They fear their job may no longer be there when they come back. And that's the issue we're seeing in the banking system all around the world is because there isn't deal flow going on, because money curves are inverted and banks cannot make money lending when short-term rates are higher than long-term rates, they stop lending. And eventually that leads to one of the biggest problems that we can face, that's rising unemployment. To be sure, banks are contending with a slump in deals around the world. So this isn't a Hong Kong issue. It's not a China issue. It's not just a U.S. issue. It's everybody's issue. As mergers and acquisition volumes in the U.S. this year at a decade low of $1.4 trillion. In terms of IPOs, about $25 billion has been raised on new exchanges, a modest bump compared to 2022, but down a whopping 90% from blockbuster year in 2021, which would make sense because people had a bunch of pandemic stimulus money and they were eager to support these IPOs. Now it's a dangerous game to go out there. The issue is it all comes back to unemployment. We'll look to that here in a bit because as we now turn to the U.S., we talk about banks, we talk about layoffs, and sure enough, this headline just a couple days ago, as Citigroup cuts over 300 senior manager roles in latest restructuring. Again, we have too many people and not enough work because there isn't enough money being created in the global economy to sustain growth and debt. And if you can't sustain your growth, then you cut heads because that means your earnings are coming down, your profits are coming down, or even your workload is coming down to the point where you just don't need as many bodies. And sure enough, that's exactly what we're seeing in the commercial banking system now. As we look at the total of net percentage of domestic banks tightening standards for commercial industrial loans to firms of all sizes, the issue we're looking for here is the constriction of credit. So anytime you see the blue line on net above that horizontal black line, it means banks are tightening standards on the way up, less tightening on the way down. But anytime over the black line, that means they're tightening standards, and that means credit gets constricted. And against that, we're looking at the commercial industrial loan data. This is on a weekly basis basis shown on a year over year rate of change. So the U.S. is facing the same problem here. You can see loan growth cooling off, going negative when banks tighten standards. You see it here during the global financial crisis. The pandemic was obvious and we're seeing the initial signs of it now. So why does this matter so much? Because when banks create loans, they create new money. And when loans get paid off, well, that money gets destroyed from the financial system. The principal part of that loan goes away, gets removed, only the interest stays. And here's one of the dangerous things about it. A lot of these loans taken many years ago were done at near 0% interest rates, meaning money's not left in the economy to sustain it. This is one of the reasons we kept inflation being a problem during the 70s is because there was high interest rates. Money stayed in the system. Today, we have central bankers doing a lot of damage on a zero interest rate policy, and it's not going to work at all. And that's why we turn now to Saudi Arabia, where we get, we see more problems. I want you to see economies are on the brink. There's just issues showing up everywhere. It's not isolated to one part of the world right now. As OPEC Plus talks hit a turbulence as Saudis agitate over output levels. And of course, we know the Saudis and a lot of these other oil producing nations, well, they need higher oil prices because they're dealing with inflation too. Their cost of doing business, their cost of living, all their costs are up and they need oil prices to rise. Now, one of the challenges is the global economy needs global prices to fall. We need energy prices to go down because what's happened? Rents have gone up, food prices are gone up. Now we know those two are going to 
stabilize over time. We know that's going to happen in the months to come. The problem here is if you leave a lot less for discretionary spending. So if you drive energy prices up, which is what OPEC's trying to do, that's less money for discretionary spending, which is less demand and less need for crude oil. You kind of get what's going on here and then price goes down. So what do they want to do? Cut production. But one thing that shouldn't be facing turbulence, well, that's your trading account. Let's go back and revisit a recent trade we had back in October on tech on QQQ. Here's what we showed you, our CTA timer pro. This mimics those machines that we talk about every Sunday that can really drive the market. It's always important you trade with the machines and not against them. And we saw these, saw these things coming off a short position on October 9th. And we paired that signal with our Momentum Timer Pro that looks at those tactical symbols, signals like the Stotch, the RSI, the MACD, all those confusing things. Well, we smooth them all out for you. And it had a one count on the daily buy signal mean technical momentum turned up on the daily we paired them together on october 9th we said buy it open right here on this candlestick here and it went down and everyone said haha see your stuff doesn't work well it did work great and we showed you that it has so far netted out a 7.8 percent return now because we won't have a show tomorrow and it's thanksgiving we've got, I've done this five coupons for a free month for cta and Momentum Time Pro. If you get to the checkout and there's no box to put the coupon, that means you missed it. Gotta wait till another day. Grab them before they're gone. The Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries and its allies are looking at an increasingly bearish picture for oil prices. And guess what? When you look at our reports, we're showing you that now. We'll show you when, of course, to get to the entry points. Just follow our system. You'll see it work like for so many. Crude is down 15% from its September peak to about 80 to a barrel in London, defying expectations that production cuts would cause a rapid tightening in markets. The outlook for next year looks even weaker with predictions of a first half surplus if the cartel sticks to his current policies. So what we're seeing, and we'll look at this when we get to the US data, is a decline in demand. Energy prices are too high. They're leading into discretionary spending, and that's leading to less demand. And less demand means lower oil prices. You know, one thing is important to understand is OPEC can do whatever they want. They can tighten supplies up. They just don't realize they're damaging the global economy and in turn damaging their own economy. And the evidence that it's all about the economy for oil prices is not so much what OPEC does, but if they wanted to do the economy a favor, they would be lowering or increasing their output, getting prices down, helping consumers out around the world. But that's not their agenda. And here you can see the current new orders were headed over to the Philly Fed data because you start to understand when manufacturing, when there's global demand, you know, when people are out wanting to buy stuff, well, you get new orders and you get it in the manufacturing sector and crude oil goes into so many things. It goes into the production, it goes into the transportation, it goes into mining of products, everything you need, it's created. Oil is there at every step of the way. And what do you see here against crude oil? This is West Texas Intermediate shown in red. As new orders go down, what happens? Oil prices go down. Doesn't matter what OPEC is doing. They have no control over the global economy. They can make it better or as they're doing now, make it worse. You see here again, new orders go down when we almost had a global synchronized recession around 2015, 2016, oil prices down. We see it going into the pandemic. We see, of course, demand come down, oil prices come down. We're seen it now new orders headed down gold prices all right again headed down you want to know when to buy keep an eye on our reports jump on those subscriptions before they're gone now let's talk about this major economy that we're seeing is now on the brink they're at a breaking point the policymakers are starting to kind of realize that maybe they went too far as ECB warns, weak economy heightens stability risks from hikes. Well, there's a shocking statement. Yes, when you actually have a weak economy and you tighten credit conditions, it causes massive stability issues, particularly within your banking system when the banks start to go. Of course, we know in the U.S. we have our small and mid-sized regional banking system is insolvent. We've been showing you since March, it didn't get better. It's gotten worse. Can you only imagine when this next crisis kicks off, it's going to affect every major economy. The only question we have is who's going to be first and perhaps it's going to be Europe.
As a weak economic outlook along with the consequences of high inflation are straining the ability of people, firms, and governments to service their debt. And that's exactly what happens. This is what we talk about. When banks constrict credit in a debt-based economy, one of the first things you start to notice as a sign of stress is delinquencies go up. And why is that? Because it's like a game of musical chairs. When the music stops, there's not enough money to maintain growth and service all the debts. And you start seeing delinquencies that eventually turn into default. It's critical to remain vigilant as the economy transitions to an environment of higher interest rates. Coupled with growing uncertainties and geopolitical tensions, at least that is until, of course, the central bankers cut rates in a big way, and they will. Because here we can see again the net percentage of domestic banks tightening standards for commercial industrial loans to firms of all sizes. And what I want you to see in this chart, if we talk about again, the central bankers inverting the money curves, the yield curves, constricting credit. So the banks are just reacting to that and then want you to see that the penalty the banks pay because we need them. They're the money centers. They create money and then they're ones that come crumbling down as you can see against the delinquency rate that's shown in red on a year-over-year -year rate of change and no surprise as banks tighten standards delinquency rates go up what a shock and as lending standards cool off delinquency rate comes down and as lending standards ease guess what the delinquency rate well it goes way down we see that here again during the global financial crisis we're starting to see it now and it's just a matter of time before it gets out of control and still, financial markets currently expect a soft landing, which is a fantasy, with, where inflation moderates without a significant hit to growth. That is not going to happen. Historical evidence suggests such a scenario is difficult, although not impossible. I don't know what historical evidence they're looking at because it's never happened, unless they want you to believe it's happened, and that means that it could happen, but it's not as you'll see in time. To achieve in practice, especially given the magnitude of rate increases in a short period of time, it's adding to the negative surprises to growth risk in a disorderly correction. This is generally not good because look at what's this. You see these notes in the article, corporate insolvencies. What are we even talking about? Delinquencies leading to defaults are starting to pick up and could rise further, though they will rise further as the economic downturn becomes more broad-based and credit costs rise. Because you have to remember during the last growth period, post global financial crisis, what did we see companies do? Leverage up, take out so much debt. It doesn't matter what the interest rates were and what did they do? They bought their stock back. So many companies are on the edge of insolvency. It's going to be ridiculous how fast central bankers get back to zero when this falls apart. There could be more defaults going forward. Well, there will be with potential knock-on effects on bank balance sheets. And it's not going to be a potential because the banks are the ones who have the loans and non-bank investors in corporate debt and household employment prospects. Officials are also warning that the environment is getting rougher for banks. Shocking, which has so far benefited from rising rates. Lenders now face higher risk provisions as more borrowers struggle to repay the loans. So again, I want you to see what central bankers are doing. Europe now looks to be at the center point of this. The ECB has done enough damage. They're completely clueless. China, as I showed you in the beginning, shows trying to cover this up as quickly as possible. But look at this. The ECB now warns that bankers' commercial real estate hit could worsen stress. And of course, that is stating the obvious of what's going to happen in the U.S. It's going to be even worse. As European banks' exposure to commercial real estate could erode financial stability if the economy is hit by a bigger shock. Commercial real estate markets have potential to significantly amplify an adverse scenario, increasing the likelihood of a systemically relevant losses being incurred in the banking system. This is absolutely going to happen because not all, you know, as we look in the U.S., we look at those small and mid-sized banks. We know they're insolvent and they've got a lot of commercial real estate debt. They're the ones that do the lending. So either rates come down in a big way and very quickly and get the curve normalized or asset prices must fall. You get falling asset prices in a slowing economy, you have a full-blown financial crisis. And it's not, again, it's not isolated to one country. It's all over the world. A scenario where real estate firms suffer very large losses would likely coincide with stress in other sectors. Moreover, a negative alchemist type would also drive large losses in other parts of the financial system, which are significantly exposed to commercial real estate, such as investment funds and insurers. So here you see the ECB starting to admit that, wait a minute, maybe the contagion risk here could be severe. It's not could be, it's going to be, and it's coming. And again, we've told you the US economy is not immune to this. We kept hearing that it was, but let's look at what's happening now.
As U.S. durable goods orders fall in weakness in the transportation equipment sector, the course Commerce Department said Wednesday that orders for durable goods, items ranging from toasters to aircraft meant to last three years or more, dropped 5.4% last month and also weighed down by declines in booking for civilian aircraft. Data for September was revised lower to show orders for goods rising 4%, instead of previously reported 4.6. So we see demand going down as manufacturing, which makes up 11.1% of the U.S. economy, is shuffling along as higher interest rates cool demand. And that is an issue because the manufacturing sector, while only 11.1% of the U.S. economy, pays quite well and has a good indicator of where the rest of the economy heads. And here we can see it's not a surprise. We pointed this out and said this would happen. Again, we're back to that same graph of the net percentage of domestic banks tightening standards for commercial industrial loans to firms of all sizes now shown against manufacturers' new orders. Because when demand goes down, because credit conditions tighten, orders go down. And when orders go down, well, you know what's eventually coming is layoffs. And sure enough, we're on the precipice of a contraction in new orders. It's kind of defied those regional Fed surveys. We said it's only a matter of time that unemployment claims rise? Well, not this week, because initial unemployment claims in the U.S. declined by the most since June. Initial claims plunged by 24,000 to 209,000 in the week ending November 18th, and continuing claims, a proxy for the number of people continuously receiving unemployment benefits, well, that eased to 1.84 million. That was the first drop in two months, but still running way too high. Here, let's take a look again at that chart of the net percentage of domestic banks tightening standards for commercial industrial loans. What do we see as money conditions tighten? What happens? Continuing claims go up. And that means those people on unemployment claims, what happens? They have less money to spend in the discretionary economy. Of course, courtesy of OPEC trying to drive oil prices up. It just adds to their misery. And despite the declines in claims, applications have been generally trending higher. During the meeting earlier this month, Federal Reserve officials said they're looking for conditions to soften further to achieve their inflation goal. Well, guess what, Fed? You're going to get it because when you put people on unemployment, as we can see here, looking at continued claims, and you keep them on it because you've tightened credit conditions so much, inflation comes crashing down each and every time. And we can see this. We're not seeing a historically large number of people on unemployment, but that means inflation has already come down significantly and further going to come down even more. And so now the only question is we started this show, we see Europe at the breaking point. We're hearing the policymakers there start to wonder if the contagion risks are big and they're deep. The answer is yes. The problem is it's not Europe. It's not just China. It's not just the U.S. It's every industrialized major economy in the world. And with that, I'm Steve Van Meter. Thanks for watching. Thanks for being fans. Bye now.